This might actually end up being my longest video ever, but like, I'm, I'm not exactly sure yet. Happy New Year, Minnows. I'm not gonna try and say anything hyperbolic about this year for animation. Just because this wasn't the high point for a lot of mainstream Western studios doesn't make it a bad overall year. It did result in a good number of disappointments, but we still had plenty of innovative experiences that once again showed what the medium can accomplish. And I can say with confidence that the best films of this year are some of my favorites of the 21st century. A lot of these are movies that I've wanted to talk about since they've come out. I just really, really, really do not want to fail out of school. I did watch a little bit less this year with a total of 18 films compared to last year's 20, but there's a lot to talk about with some of these, which is why it took me so long to get this video out. But my delay did make it so that I was able to watch everything I wanted to watch for this list, at least the stuff that was on my radar. So just like last year, leave me any recommendations for any animated movies that I might have missed in the comment section. Though I will say, some of my play Placements of the more popular stuff will make a good number of people unhappy. So if you're not active on animation Twitter, I'm guessing you have no idea about The Monkey King. And the easiest way I can explain it to anybody who hasn't seen it is, um... Oh, okay. Since a lot of you guys were really mad at me for not liking Jack Horner, I'll use him to explain my point. What if... As written, he was the protagonist of a movie and his greed and egotism were portrayed in a completely positive light. All of the magic in the world for me. That would be a pretty bad idea, wouldn't it? Well, that's what this movie is. It's a movie about a monkey trying to become an immortal god from scratch because he doesn't fit in with other monkeys. And this character is one of the biggest pricks that I've ever seen in a movie. Like, it's that bad. He's equal parts annoying and reckless and everything that's preventing him from achieving immortality feels warranted. Including the villain who's really only after him because it's his magic staff that he stole. It's painful to sit through for the majority of the runtime with how repetitive and unfunny the story is. 95% of it is just the monkey and this girl going to a location and him leaving behind a big mess in that location while also being the writer's very warped idea of charismatic. Actually, I'm gonna play an out of context clip and let you guys be the judge. We can't give up now. We? Who's this we? I'm still gonna join the immortal ones, just not with you. Yeah, I really am struggling to think of the last time I had this unpleasant of a time with the protagonist of a movie. And I do have other problems with this movie, but outside of the main character, they're all just typical things you would expect to come from a low-end animated Netflix original, where basically everything outside of the animation is subpar. And why are heaven and hell locations here when Buddha is a prominent character? Buddhists don't believe in that. But I will say this, the scene where all the characters do travel to hell was so unironically funny and creative that it felt off in the context of this movie. Still, it's a very badly paced and poorly constructed story with the main character I actively wanted to see lose, and I recommend avoiding it at all costs. I don't know if y'all saw what I was trying to do there, but it was like my way of subtly foreshadowing the next movie on this list. Here I are. Here I are. This was an actual line in a Disney song. Watch out world, here I are. They listened to this lyric and thought that it was good enough to make it into the final cuts. I hate this movie so much. It's infuriating that this is the best Disney could give us for their 100th year anniversary, which makes this movie being bad stick out even more given how heavily it was marketed as a return to form for Disney's classic fairy tales. Do I really need to elaborate on why though? Everyone's already talked about the references to older Disney films, the weird uncanny art style, the songs. Oh damn, those songs. It's so terrible at being a musical. Lyrically, these songs are awful at advancing the story, characters, and concepts. And I say lyrically because these songs have so many nonsensical empty words and phrases that are thrown into there or have no correlation with the scene they're placed in. The only real exception is the opening number. It has some of those weird rhyme pairings, but it at least has a catchy course and is a fine way of establishing the main location. This is the thanks I get as a pitiful attempt at making King Magnifico intimidating. At all costs is uncomfortable because it's sung like a love song directly contradicting the relationship between the two vocalists. Knowing what I know now forces a completely out of place redemptive arc for 
the queen. And these are the songs that sound decent out of context. When it comes to the universe, we're all shareholders. I thoroughly loathe everything about this song. I hate how it gives us no information. I hate that it's where the magic of the film peaks. I hate that Valentino's entire personality is that he talks. I hate that it uses grammatically incorrect sentences in favor of making the song rhyme. Like that's the absolute bare minimum for a piece of music with words and it can't even do that right. I don't think this is Julia Michaels fault though. It's not like she hasn't written songs that I liked before, but it does seem like Disney just took the first drafts of everything she and Benjamin Rice wrote together and the result is a disaster. It made me question if we should let animals be silent till the end of time, but then I started playing Animal Crossing New Horizons and that brought me back to reality. Damn, where has this game been all my life? It's so perfect. <laughs> Wish has all the aesthetics of a classic Disney musical, but none of them have the same impact as what came before. The reason why I think that's the case, though, is the main reason why I cannot stand this movie. I made a video last month specifically talking about King Magnifico and the weird role he has in the story, and it made me think about an aspect of this film that's probably going to need more time dedicated to it separate from this video, but here's what I'll say about it here. The concept of wishing on a star isn't something that needs a whole lot of nuance. It's an idea that King can and should remain pure and magical in its simplicity. But if we're gonna assume that everyone in the city of Rosas has a wish worth granting and Asha's I Want Son represents her determination to make it possible, then Wish is a movie about capitalism. All you have to do is get rid of the evil, unstable person in charge who's only that way to irrationalize a rational ideology, and the only thing holding you back from achieving your goals in a place where all your dreams and realities come to life is hard work. I hate Wish not just because it has so many elements that I hate about corporate Disney, but that it's a direct self-insert for corporate Disney. And even though I can think of four or five films from the studio that I consider to be worse in terms of their filmmaking, this is the one that I'm personally hurt by the most. There was so much missed potential here, but what they ultimately went with broke me. At least Ralph Breaks the Internet has consistently good animation, a subversive musical number, fun new side characters, some creative integrations of the internet into its plots, a good message at its core, violence against a pedophile, and a shark for 15 seconds of screen time. And I would much rather have that than this movie. Kung Fu Panda 4 won't be as bad. Kung Fu Panda 4 won't be as bad. Kung Fu Panda 4 won't be as bad. <laughs> seeing how much Ruby Gilman Teenage Kraken flopped at the box office, I felt a little bit guilty considering it was obviously the result of lackluster marketing. I never gleefully take pleasure in animated movies bombing, even ones that I don't like. But this feels more like an Illumination movie than the actual Illumination movies that came out this year. Ouch. Last year, DreamWorks unexpectedly gave us two of their all-time best movies. I say unexpectedly since before 2022, they went six years without making a movie that I like, and this would fit right in with their lineup in the 2010s. It's about the main character being a kraken, but also wanting to live life like a regular high school girl. Most of the melodrama there is not the worst, but very sanitized and safe. The worst part of this movie, though, comes from the kraken side of Ruby Gilman Teen age kraken it hardly ever takes its time to showcase how any of the main characters relationships are impacted by her being a mystical creature because it doesn't this framing device just feels like a cover-up for how conventional the conflicts are here it's mostly just irresponsibility on her mom's part for not telling ruby about her powers the fact that she's an heir to the throne or their history with mermaids because she has personal beef with her mother and then we have chelsea oh my god easily one of the most obnoxious characters to come out of the studio and the twist with her is awful. Not just with the lightning pace of her transition from ally to enemy, but also that it doesn't work within the narrative. And I do like the idea of Ruby having an optimistic view on being able to break the generational conflict between the two species. But if the movie wanted that to be its focus, then maybe they shouldn't have made Chelsea the ancient arch nemesis of her grandmother, or at least shown us other mermaids that aren't pure evil. But I guess that was an afterthought since they wanted to make sure Ruby had a big climactic battle as a giant kraken 
fine. I'm not gonna try and say that this movie deserved to bomb, but it falls so much lower than the standard set by the studio last year, and continues to show how Universal's influence the writing, tone, comedic style, and overall quality of their output for the worse. I at least had fun with some of the side characters, and there was a Puss in Boots reference in the beginning that was kinda cute. There's a lizard called Chichak, sneaking around slowly. This is the most relieved I've ever felt watching something so standard and forgettable. And bear in mind that we're not just talking about any combination for a movie here. This is an animated musical comedy written by Adam Sandler from Happy Madison Productions. Do you guys remember the last time that this happened? Standard and Forgettable is the best case scenario for this film's existence. I mean, it's kinda cool. All right, so here Adam Sandler is a lizard who's been a fifth grade class pet for over 75 years, and he wants to explore the world after finding out that he may be dying. But he ends up using all his life experience to help bond with these kids going through the different struggles that come with growing up. That's not a bad idea for a movie, and I feel like it could be really interesting if it was anybody other than Adam Sandler writing it. I don't even have anything against him as a person, I just don't think his movies are that good, and more importantly, not funny. This movie somewhat falls into that category with how much gross-out humor there is and how it clashes with the edgy jokes that he tries to sneak in there, but it weirdly didn't bother me as much here. I guess it might be because the characters are in elementary school and I could realistically imagine them acting this way. It didn't make any of those jokes funnier, mind you, but it mostly felt like white noise and didn't take me out of the film. But you guys want to know what did take me out of it? The song. It's baffling how he managed to not make his jokes the worst part of one of his movies. That's how terrible the songs in this are. Like, what the hell is supposed to be appealing about the dad singing about how he cheated his way to get his daughter extra time? And there's also the animation, which isn't bad, but a bit inconsistent. Mainly because how it tries to go for a more realistic style with all the animals outside of the main two. And the weird looking designs of these kindergartners that look out of place alongside the rest of the humans. Alright, alright, alright. I spent a lot of time complaining complaining about this movie so far, but I did say it was a little better than I expected, so what about it do I think is good? Well, the story's alright. It's nice to see Adam Sandler be a character that's likable for once, and there are some really cute moments that he has. I never really felt like I was just watching him as a lizard. He's able to bring this character to life very well. I like the bond he forms with the kids, plus he develops a clever dynamic with this old substitute teacher who used to be a student in the class he was in. It all flows pretty well, and once the movie tones down the F-tier musical number, it has a pretty satisfying conclusion. All of these things are brought down by the worst elements that pop up with Adam Sandler's works. Aside from the wonky visuals, those are bad on their own right. But when looking at this alongside the rest of his filmography, specifically the things that he's written himself, this at least has a good amount of charm to it and is mostly just inoffensive. But how did this movie manage to get afloat in the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade? I don't get it. This Christmas, all the bells are ringing. Diary of a Wimpy Kid Cabin Fever, against all odds, is not terrible. I can't believe this is higher on the list than Wish, that's just embarrassing. It's got a lot of the same problems as the first two, like the bad animation and bad dialogue. The fact that one terrible Disney retelling of this series managed to spawn an entire franchise defies rationale, but I guess more people are into these than I thought. That being said, I was a little bit dramatic last year when talking about Roderick Rules. The point where it becomes an unrecognizable pile of mush, devoid of anything in terms of personality that makes it feel hollow beyond all reason. Okay, but back to this movie. It adapts the plot of Cabin Fever fine enough. It's the first time in the series I think Greg has a well put together arc, learning the importance of doing the right thing and appreciating his family even though they drive him crazy. It's basic, but it's a good lesson to have for a holiday movie. This is the first time I think one of these movies movies would have benefited from a longer runtime, since I do wish the way that this happens was paced better. He and Rowley accidentally vandalize a snowplow and he spends the whole movie trying to avoid getting caught, on top of being snowed in with his family. So the plot of the second half of the book, alright. He ends up making up with everybody, but I don't think enough time was dedicated to positive interactions with the family members, especially considering they keep the part where Manny hoards all their emergency supplies. This kid is an actual spawn of Satan and I need more people to realize that. And... Uh, 
I don't really have that much to say about this one. It still doesn't change my overall opinion on the franchise, but it didn't actively irritate me like the other two, and it had enough decent things in it to make it the best out of the three for me. Baby, we make real bands go home and slip their wrists. We are the seventh sign of the apocalypse. I don't know if they did that on purpose, but either way, it's really funny. I don't think I would have sought this movie out if not for this video since I don't like this franchise, but in addition to me having more about it to say than I thought, I think Trolls Band Together barely edges out Ruby Gilman for me, mostly because it gets more wacky and creative with the animation, and also the fact that it has Camila Cabello. I know, I know, I'm letting my harmonizer brain get the best of me just this once. Most of my issues with this movie are issues that are there with the whole trilogy. Poppy and Branch's relationship drama is basically the same as it is in the other two. He needs to open up more, she needs to acknowledge his limits. I get it. It's very repetitive and evident how there's been no real progression in their relationship between these movies. There's a one-off line about Branch suggesting that they get married, and I'm surprised they didn't pay that off at all. It would be a predictable running gag, but it would be a natural milestone for their characters and wouldn't do anything to undermine any themes or character arcs. This is why I hate the hidden world. Okay, you know what? I'm not even gonna... Some things are worse, like the heavy use of auto-tune for the song covers and turning the obnoxious reference humor up to like 20. Justin Timberlake's long-lost siblings being a part of the band. I should have known they would have made all those boy band jokes. We've gone from boys to men and now there's only one direction for us to go. The backstreet. There's also some pacing issues with everything outside of Branch rescuing his brothers. A fine setup, but one that takes focus from Poppy reuniting with her long lost sister, which feels very tacked on. She only gets one scene to establish her backstory about being separated from her and how she's still having to live in fear of the. of the. hold on a second and how she's still living in fear of the Bergens with no knowledge of how her sister befriended them, and it's instantly rectified by the time we get to the third act. It seems like it would have been better if the writers reserved this subplot for a different movie, because there's too much about it to really work as a subplot. And yeah, I know a lot of people like the villains of this movie, but I thought they were both obnoxious. They don't really do anything to raise the stakes either, despite the characters having to rescue Floyd from them. And to add on to that, one of them is voiced by Amy Schumer. Why? It's like they saw that James Corden wasn't going to be in the movie, and they figured that they just needed to make up for that by replacing him with someone infinitely worse. That being said, though, that being said, having the main antagonist of your movie being a person who's insanely popular despite their lack of talent is deliciously ironic considering who's playing her. So, none of the new characters this movie introduces are good, except for Floyd, who has a pretty sweet relationship with Branch, independent of how strained his relationship with the others is. It's nice that Fishlegs and the other Bergen lady from the first movie have a role in the story this time. It has good things in it, but the majority of them get lost in the midst of things that have dragged down the entire franchise. They invent troll versions of NSYNC at the last second, just so Justin Timberlake can reunite with them in-universe. Hey, I get that I'm not the target audience for these movies, but don't you dare use the excuse that I expect every DreamWorks film to be as deep as Puss in Boots The Last Wish. My favorite DreamWorks movie of last year was the one where the LGBTQ furry steal a butt-shaped rock. I'm perfectly capable of enjoying movies that aren't trying to be profound. You guys remember how I said that Ruby Gilman felt more like Illumination than the Illumination films that came out this year? Well, I've got a confession to make. I wrote and recorded that segment before I watched Migration. But here's the thing, when I watched the trailer for this movie, I had a feeling that it wasn't going to be like the other ones that they made, and I turned out to be right. Does that mean that I think the movie is good? I didn't say that. Okay, so that means that I think the movie is bad. I didn't say that either. This is Illumination's first non-franchise film in a while. I don't count Mario, since that's an adaptation of one of the most popular and recognizable IPs of all time. So I was curious to see how it turned out, and I will say that even though I didn't like it that much, it isn't for the reasons I normally dislike their movies. There's less gross-out humor, 
humor, less pop culture references, and more authentic casting choices. I mean, unless you want to count Aquafina, but she's only in it for about like 15 minutes. And everything will be all right. Nothing about this movie feels cynical, and I never felt like I was watching an Illumination film. But in terms of the actual journey, it's a little rough. A lot of the misadventures the family gets into feel like they're just there to stretch out the runtime, meaning it's difficult to anchor yourself in a lot of the locations they travel to. I don't exactly think the movie needed to be longer, just have it be that the birds go to Jamaica, get lost in New York, have all their misadventures happen there, and then end with them reaching their destination. The movie mostly does this because it wants them to interact with all these kooky side characters, and not all of them feel relevant to the story, but I probably would have been more forgiving if they all came from New York. The main characters are kind of sweet though, even though their arcs are pretty basic. And it's a rare instance of the direction of one of their movies being the standout between the flying sequences and perspective shots. It's a fine enough family film that, in spite of my issues, is still showing some form of much needed improvement from the studio that it's coming from. Though I have to say, I don't think it's gonna last much longer. Four Despicable Me's? Four? Like, really? Also, yes, the vector short was a lot of fun. Fire. Elemental still has to be the most mixed that I've been on a Pixar movie. It is still nice that it was able to make a financial comeback since Pixar actually allowed it to stay in theaters, instead of just throwing it onto Disney Plus after like a month. And more significantly, it was really cool to hear that many South Koreans and other immigrants related to its themes. I'm happy that Peter Son got the chance to tell what was very clearly a personal story. And after watching it a second time, it's clear that most of my problems with the movie tie back to its setting. The writing for the characters is actually pretty solid solid, especially everything involving Ember. How her passions and feelings for Wade conflict with her wanting to repay her parents for sacrificing everything to give her a better life. There are also some clever details sprinkled in that mirror real-life immigration experiences, like when her parents are given English names because their native ones are too difficult to pronounce, or how they're perceived as the more dangerous elements despite Element City not being built with them in mind, to the point where they have to build their own community. It's easily the best part of the movie because it's the one where it feels like much more effort was put into integrating it into this setup, but everything else about it shows how messy and poorly established the rules of this universe are, and that it would have been better if the story was just told with humans. The entire concept of not being able to mix doesn't logically make sense for anyone outside of fire people. If it was just them and water that resided in Element City, then you could argue that it's just a societal misconception that Ember and Wade need to break. But seriously, what reason is there for any combination of elements that don't have fire involved to not mix with each other? You could at least show more examples of the disdain for it, but none of the elements outside of water and fire are given any focus. It's a world that's visually striking, but can conceptually devoid of any form of logic or rationale, and it's why it's so difficult for me to get invested in the romance between the two leads. In the climax, Wade ends up trapped with Ember and ends up evaporating because the heat is too much for his body. But how exactly does that mean that he's able to touch the source of heat that got him killed for an extended period of time? And once again, I feel like all these problems could have been avoided if they decided to just let the characters be regular people. You can make a movie about prejudice in a way kids can understand, it doesn't always have to be allegorical. It does it doesn't just apply to the emotional core, either. A lot of the element-related jokes are pretty lackluster as well, it's mostly just puns with the occasional visual gag that I think is supposed to be parodying something. Okay, seriously though, if anybody knows why somebody would find the pruning joke funny, please let me know, I'm genuinely curious. I feel like even Cars did a better job of incorporating in-universe adult jokes, since a good number of them are clever equivalents of things that happen in the real world. I mean, just take a look at this scene where the twins show Lightning McGroomer their headlights. <laughs> See, it's meant to be funny because Panda 3. Okay, okay, I have other problems with this movie that don't tie back to its premise, like that stupid, stupid twin. twin. Can we please let the little kid flirting with older women trope die? It's so tired. In general, though, the side characters in this are mostly pretty disposable. I like both of Ember's parents, but everyone else is either annoying or not given enough screen time to leave an impact. And the third act has a lot of tedious bits that don't feel necessary to the story, but the actual ending did get me a little soft, and I feel bad for not mentioning it in my original review. There is one more 
thing that I want to address though. I've seen a good number of people online saying that the lack of support for this movie is a contributing factor to Pixar making less original movies. I definitely won't pretend that isn't true to some extent, but I think it's important to note that something being original doesn't automatically make it good. In the same way that something being a sequel or spin-off doesn't automatically make it bad. Execution matters in both instances. I don't think it's possible for Elemental to fail as a Pixar movie because that treats their filmography like a monolith. I just think as both a rom-com and a commentary regarding race and prejudice, it falls short due to the world it's confined in. Time to say good night. There are two things I learned from the three biopics that I watched this year. The first thing is that not every historical figure throughout history is worthy of an entire movie, even if they accomplished a lot in their lifetime. And the second thing is that even the ones that are still need good writing to make for an engaging film. Film. The Inventor is a stop-motion indie animated biopic about Leonardo da Vinci, and I thought it was a charming film, but one that didn't have enough story content to fill its runtime, something you can very clearly tell when watching it. There isn't a whole lot of momentum as we watch Leo join the French court to be artistically experimental while building a city, and the amount of characters makes it a little difficult to follow at times. I do really like the art style though, especially the character designs and usage of 2D that's meant to emulate an art architect sketches. They strategically use it whenever Leo comes up with an idea or when there's a musical number. And yep, there are songs in this movie. Not as bad as Leo's or the worst ones in Wish, but also not necessary to the story. Leonardo's also a solid main character. Even though it isn't focused on well, I like how he has to push back against religious cynics trying to moralize his artistic curiosity and the bond he forms with Daisy Ridley. It's a movie that could have had a tighter script, but it's still very cute, earnest, and better than the Bradley Cooper biopic. If you want to give him an Oscar so badly, just give him one for the damn raccoon. <laughs> You guys ever watch a mediocre piece of media, but there's one individual aspect of it that permanently changes the trajectory of your life? Oh, Bowser. Oh, sweet, sweet Bowser. I finally found it. Now who's gonna stop me? When the cast for this movie was first announced, I wasn't sure how they were gonna deal with Bowser vocally, since he rarely has any spoken lines, just angry monster noises. Okay, so I forgot that he talks in sunshine, but Jack Black still doesn't sound like him. It could be my Kung Fu Panda brain rot. He just seemed like the wrong choice given how he sounds. But I was there, y'all. I was there the first time I heard it. It altered my brain chemistry. This is the second time he's brought a character to life that's defined my existence as a human being. How? How did Illumination do this? How is it that they masterfully brought him to life for the big screen? The A-list celebrity voice acting is one of the worst recurring elements of their movies, and yet Jack Black gives what can stand alongside Robin Williams as the genie as one of my favorite vocal performances in anything. His motivation throughout most of the games is taking over the Mushroom Kingdom and capturing Princess Peach, and they do not shy away from the sociopathic incel vibes that that premise gives off. They emphasize that he's not going to stop at anything to marry Peach, and that he becomes more dangerous of a threat and more intimidating the closer she gets to Mario, even though there's never anything explicitly romantic about their relationship in the movie. But even though he has the same petty and insecure motivation that he does in most of the games, he still manages to be in intimidating with the unhinged use of his powers, and endlessly creative use of his animation and facial expressions. I think it adds so much to the seemingly limitless range of his expressions, and doesn't clash with the other character designs at all. He can be a big scary monster in one scene, and the most huggable thing in the universe the next. Look at this face. Look at this face. He proves to still be a capable and strategic leader, even though he has an entire silly love ballad about how much he loves Peach. Oh my gosh, Jack Black needs to see 
seeing in more animated movies. I remember the first time I heard him sing back in 2016 for one of the promotional videos for Kung Fu Panda 3, and I have been transfixed by Jablinski's career as a musician just as much as an actor. Don't you love how intentionally goofy the lyrics are and how passionate and intense he is nonetheless? Oh, Bowser, you goofball. You don't need to be wasting this much energy on Peach. If it were Rosie, I'd 1000% get it, but there's so much more for you out there, man. You can change, Bowser. I know you can. This is my favorite adaptation of Bowser by far, and he was already my favorite character in the Mario universe. And if you guys would unironically watch an entire video for me explaining why that's the case, just say the word in the comments and I'll make it happen. Sorry, I uh, low-key got a little sidetracked there, but uh, Mario, it's... It's okay. I'll kill you! You traitor! I'm just having a pretty difficult time understanding what people who aren't fans of Mario would get out of this. Which is why I've always been rubbed the wrong way towards this movie's diehard defenders that insist that if you don't like this movie, it means that you just hate fun. And not everything has to be on the same level of depth as a Pixar movie. Because it is a movie that's heavily relying on Mario fan service, and not everybody's gonna get a whole lot out of that. There's a lot of subtle nods to other games outside of Mario Kart that most people haven't played. The score of the movie contains a lot of reorchestrations of classic musical themes. Even with the sound design, I forgot to mention that they kept some of Bowser's original noises from voice actor Kenny James that sneaked their way in there, and it's understandable why some people may be a little lost with how the rules of this universe work, since the movie assumes you know how they do, going in. So, it works as a Mario movie, but it has a lot of flaws as just a movie that go beyond the fan service. And I wish fans of this movie would stop being so hostile to people who don't like it. A lot of people have said that this movie doesn't have a plot, which I don't really think is true. Mario and Luigi are brothers, but one of them gets lost in the Mushroom Kingdom, so the other has to save them from the giant turtle who wants to destroy the Mushroom Kingdom as well. The story is there, but the way the movie rushes between individual scenes and has elements that would seem like plot convenient is to anyone who isn't familiar with them, make it feel more hollow and unfocused than it should be. There isn't a whole lot of time to draw attention to the strength of Mario and Luigi's bond, which the movie wants to be the core of the story. And it also doesn't help that he gets sidelined once Big Bow Wow holds him hostage. So the story here is a little clunky, and Illumination's fingerprints are still there. The licensed music choices are ill-fitting except for the DK rap. And even though Jablinski as Turtle Tuck is a match made in heaven, the rest of the A-listers are pretty spread out out in terms of quality. I don't get the sudden turnaround for Chris Pratt as Mario, y'all. He's just inconsistent with the accent he wants for the character, and it never feels natural. Anya Taylor-Joy and Fred Armisen both feel like they're just themselves, but the rest of the voice acting is pretty good. It has enough things that people who aren't fans of the franchise can enjoy. The animation, the score, the environment, the climax, and some individual character moments that are charming. But a part of me wonders if people only praise this movie as much as they do because it came from a Illumination, since it does look insanely better by comparison. I mean, they've only made two movies that I think are good, and it is a net positive in that context. Just not as good or bad as both extremes make it out to be. Um, what else is there? I didn't like when the Yoshi egg showed up in the post credits. I did like when Pauline showed up, which I'm guessing was foreshadowing her being in the booster course pass. And as much as I like Peaches, you guys really misunderstood the point of that song by making regular pop covers of it on TikTok. The fact that Kids Bop did their own rendition of it is the last straw. But you know what? If that's what it takes to get this movie a best original, never mind. Oh, also Illumination, please adapt Super Mario Galaxy if you're gonna do a sequel. Movie Bowser and Movie Rosalina would probably make me combust. Even though I don't talk about it a whole lot on this channel, yes, I do watch anime. One anime that I watched this year was Suzume, it's from the guy who directed Your Name, Matako Sumkai, which really surprised me with how good it turned out to be in regards to its setup, and blending so many different genres. But this movie was kind of tormented by a lot of the travesties you would expect to come from that premise. The two outstanding elements for me would be the animation and the chemistry between the two leads, but there are two very distinct stories being told here. The first one is about the two leads having to close all these magic portals that are causing natural disasters, and one of those characters turns into a sentient chair. 
I do not mean that figuratively, Suda is an actual three-legged chair for a very long portion of this movie. That was a little too distracting and goofy for me to take seriously. The story could have functioned the exact same way if he had just turned into a bird. The first half isn't terrible overall, there are a lot of really powerful moments between Suzume and Suta that sporadically make their way in there, but it can get repetitive. It does get a lot more character driven in the second half, picking up on the dramatic beats set up early on pretty well, but it feels very disconnected from a lot of the things that happen leading up to it. And it made for a very messy and convoluted screenplay that didn't keep my interest all the way through. The good elements here, though, are enough for me to encourage you to still seek it out, even though it personally didn't click for me on the first viewing. To be fair, it did take a second rewatch for Your Name to go from good to a masterpiece for me, so maybe the same thing might happen with this movie. A Christmas movie, but Yin said it's January and the holiday season isn't for another 11 months. Merry Little Batman initially wasn't going to be on this list, but one of my friends recommended it to me and I figured I'd give it a watch. And I thought it was cute. It reminded me a lot of Lego Batman movie and doing like a more lighthearted and down to earth story about a character like Batman who's frequently portrayed as dark and serious. And let me just say that his design is easily my favorite part of the movie. Like, this should not work, but it does. He also has a son here, and it's about him being in a rush to grow up so he can fight crime with his dad. I feel like that's a very relatable idea for kids who like superheroes. Idolizing all the cool fighting and action while not recognizing the more dangerous side of hero work. But I do think it did a bit of a poor job effectively delivering the right message that should have come with it. Batman and his son get to team up together in the end, but it makes him look very irresponsible given how young the kid is. He's a toddler, of course he shouldn't be fighting crime. And I know it's a superhero movie, but it rubbed me the wrong way a little bit since it reverts from what I consider to be a far better message in the third act. And also, I wasn't really a huge fan of the actor they chose to play Bruce. This is not the voice I would expect to come out of a character who looks like this. It isn't one of the best Batman movies, but it's a cozy little thing you can enjoy for the holiday season. <laughs> This isn't scripted, but I gotta tell you guys this. Guess who plays Alfred in this version of Batman? <laughs> you guys are not gonna believe it, okay? You guys ready? <laughs> if that's what it takes for y'all to watch this movie, then let it be. One little chick said peep, peep, peep. But four little chicks stayed fast asleep. I did not expect to like the Chicken Run sequel as much as I did, but... I love you, mommy. I can't help it, y'all. This movie's a really good time. It's got amazing updated stop-motion animation, the same great characters, and I honestly think it's way funnier than the original and the funniest movie on this list. It's probably because it does opt to have a more lighthearted tone than the first one, and I can understand why a lot of people like it less as a result. That and the fact that it's not really a sequel that needs to exist. But as stated earlier in the video, sometimes a movie can counteract that if it's good enough on its own merits, and I like this movie story a lot. I think it's a clever idea to have Ginger's daughter want to go out and explore the world, even though her mom's overprotective of her because of the lengths they went through to escape Miss Tweety's farm. And what Ginger considers to be freedom might not mean the same thing to her, since it's the only life she's ever known. I will say that it gets structurally similar to the first movie in the final act a lot, which is one of the downsides of Miss Tweety being the surprise final antagonist again. She's still entertaining, but the tone makes her not as intimidating, and it once again goes back to the KFC having to break everybody out of the location that she's operating. Oh, and one last thing, if you're gonna replace the voice actor for one of your characters because they're a terrible person, maybe don't replace them with another terrible person who also gives a worse performance. Zachary Levi sucks in this movie. As much as I hate Mel Gibson, he at least added some much needed charisma for Rocky, which is non-existent in this performance. But I think those few elements that are inferior to the original are brought to equilibrium by things that surpass it and make me hold both of them in equally high esteem. See, it isn't unnecessary sequels, but bad unnecessary sequels that people are tired of. And fortunately, this movie isn't one of them.
two Ninja Turtle movies in the span of two years. Okay, I see you. Mutant Mayhem is so good, y'all. It's one of the most innovative and visually unique animated movies I've ever seen, and easily the best looking one of the year. With the exception of that other movie that came out, which we'll talk about later. And it's like so cool that even though it's designed to be grotesque, it adds like this extra layer of atmosphere to it between the usage of 2D for liquids and explosions and the diversity of the character designs, all of whom are effortlessly brought to life by the voice acting. It's nice that they were able to get actual teenagers to voice the boys for once and seeing the directors talk about how they let them improvise a lot of the scenes is a testament to how naturally charismatic their chemistry is here. I mean, Leo is the same guy who voiced Gumball. How cool is that? And yes, a lot of the adults are A-listers, but they do a pretty good job too. My two personal favorites would probably have to be Ice Cube as the main villain Superfly and Paul Rudd as Mondo Gecko. Man, I forgot how funny he could be when he's written well. The narrative does tread a lot of familiar territory, but it still lends itself well to a Ninja Turtle origin story. It places emphasis on how they're othered by society despite being superheroes and that their good nature and optimism towards change is what distinguishes them from Superfly, despite basically having the same circumstances. Maybe I'm just kind of a sucker for movies about a likable group of outcasts finally finding their place in society. <clears throat> Sorry, I just had something in my throat there. Can the pop culture references be a little bit excessive? Yes. In fact, if this movie didn't look as amazing as it does, I think way fewer people would be looking the other way with them. And the thing is, like, it's not even the use of terminology like sus or riz. That's just a reflection of how teens these days talk. Believe me, I have younger brothers. It's mainly the inclusion of real life brands and celebrities that got on my nerves. If it was just one thing the boys hyperfixated on, that would have been fine. But most of it is just sporadic rapid fire of Gen Z trends with no consistent through line, and it gets old really fast. There's also this side villain played by Maya Rudolph that only exists to pay off this one running gag about Splinter's fear that if the guys explore the outside world, they'll literally get milked by humans. Does it hurt? Of course it hurts. She's milking me. Um, no thanks. And also Leo has a crush on April. God, why do they always do this? I've always been really uncomfortable with the idea of her having to be a romantic target for any of the turtles. And I haven't seen any piece of Ninja Turtles media where it's executed well, with this movie included. But at least here it's presented as a harmless teenage crush and not played straight to the point where it becomes morally reprehensible like in 2012. I really hope the series doesn't keep it going though, because beyond that and my other problems, this is a very creative interpretation of these characters that I'm enthusiastic to see more of. The ending has them going to high school. That would be a really great new environment for them to be in for the new series, which I will be watching, don't worry. It is going to be the most amazing thing in the world if this universe manages to look this good with a TV budget. It's so romantic in Paris. Ernest and Celestine, A Trip to Gibertia is a sequel to the Academy Award-nominated French comedic drama Ernest and Celestine, and the fact that nobody's talking about this duology is a crime against humanity. Now, the reason why I'm recommending them both to you is because it's a little difficult to discuss this movie without talking about the first, which I'm guessing most of you haven't seen before. The second one's not as good because it bites off a bit more than it can chew for 81 minutes of runtime, making the script not as focused. But the two leads are still likable, They're there's fun new characters, the animation is great, the way they incorporate music into the plot is very creative, and it still balances its real life subject matter with so many wholesome moments and deserves a lot more attention. I don't know when it's going to be available for streaming yet, I actually had to buy it directly on YouTube, but I do know the first one is free on Tubi, so you guys have absolutely no excuse not to watch it. So there was like this independent art house film that came out in June. It kind of flew under the radar. It's called Spider-Man Across the Spider-Verse. You know, I'm honestly really surprised that nobody has talked about this movie. And this is going to be an unpopular opinion, probably, but like, it's... It's a pretty good movie. I know you guys have permission to yell at me in the comments. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. Now, since this movie has pretty much been talked about to death online, I'm going to get my very small personal issues out of the way before singing its well-deserved praises. Some of the fan service in this movie is bad. Like, very, very, very bad. The original Spider-Verse was really good at organically providing references that invoked memories for hardcore fans without feeling out of place for normies. But this movie's usage of it, while not entirely unwarranted given the diverse collection of spider people we see, is very random. 
random at times. I feel like 25 or so years from now, when I show this to my hypothetical kids, the significance of live action Donald Glover or the ghost of Doc Ock isn't going to age all that well. I expected it to be more akin to the inclusion of a Lego universe, which is an abstract concept that feels more at home with this story and not off to someone who's familiar with these Easter eggs. In my opinion, they took things a step too far for the middle chapter of this story, and I think this kind of endgame level fan service should have been reserved for the final chapter. It has me a little worried about what they're going to end up doing for Beyond in this regard, but not too much. And secondly, with how much Miguel berates Miles in the film, maybe the movie could have benefited from an explanation for why he has such a desire to escape his own universe or what he was like before. I know he's meant to be mysterious and clearly is suffering from a lot of trauma, but the amount of mystery that still surrounds him doesn't lend itself well to how unhinged he is in this movie. It's more of a missed opportunity and will probably be explained in the next movie, but it did hinder my investment in his character a little bit and just those two things just those two things yeah other than that this movie 1000 percent lived up to the hype i think my favorite part of the movie is how it deconstructs the idea of animated movies needing to be consistent in order to be stylized giving us one of the most visually inventive films of all time in the process my friend jess's letterbox review of this movie is i want to inject this movie's art style directly into my veins and she could not be more right. The way that this film blends so many different styles together feels inhuman, and it makes every single moment enthralling. And the look of this film enhances a captivating continuation of the first film, between the expansion of the titular Spider-Verse, the enhancement of seemingly innocuous details that are given narrative relevance, and the seemingly limitless levels of depth and complexities that are added to the characters. Like, this might actually be the closest that we'll ever get to a modern-day Empire Strikes Back. You're so easily in enamored by Miles' determination to prove his worth as a hero, even when it means challenging the status quo that comes with taking on the mantle as Spider-Man. How it causes a wedge to form between him and his former friends as they've been allowed into an elite society that will never accept him because of his accidental origins. Again, I'm not joking when I say that I consider the reveals of Miles inheriting his spider powers being the root of the anomalies across the multiverse to be on par with... I am your father. It completely changes the trajectory of the overarching story and makes room for so much speculation about the direction the next movie will take with this new information being revealed to us. There is still a sense of closure to this conclusion, even though it ends on a cliffhanger. Thanks to Gwen concluding her arc by reconciling with her father and forming up her own rescue team after being exiled by Miguel for aiding Miles. She's essentially the deutragonist of this movie, and her journey throughout it is equally as strong as his. Being torn between her attachment to Miles and her initial escapism from her father through Miguel and Jessica Drew. It's so satisfying to see her decide to form her own rogue band of heroes to save Miles, even if they aren't the ideal group of spider people in their eyes. Which is so stupid because any team with Hobie Brown on it is already objectively perfect. Is this movie as flawless as the original Spider-Verse? In my opinion, no. But it's still a once-in-a-lifetime experience, and it's really encouraging to see how it's allowed the franchise to become so much more prevalent in pop culture. But Lord and Miller, I must humbly request that you do a better job at managing the production next time. Cause I don't think it's a very outlandish request to want genre defining masterpieces like this without coming at the expense of the mental health of the animators. So please use this delay wisely. If you've watched my ranking videos, then you'll know that I typically tend to put the best movie or the one that i consider to be the best in the number one spot almost every time this is going to be one of those rare times where i break that rule and i normally don't have to do that because the one that i consider to be the best typically is also my favorite so yes this next movie is the one that i consider to be the best but the number one movie is my personal favorite so let's get into it the Boy and the Heron is the best animated movie of 2023. Now, I've only watched about half of Studio Ghibli's filmography so far, but this is definitely one of my favorites. And what's probably going to end up being the actual most controversial take for me is that it's my favorite from Miyazaki. I'm probably a little biased since this was my first Ghibli film in theaters, but it really does hit differently watching his vision come to life on the big screen. Between the score, brilliant use of silence that allows the visuals to tell the story, and the action 
acting pair that defined my generation. I know a lot of anime fans swear off dubs altogether, but the English voice actors are all perfect here, and it'll be the one time that I insist you give the dub a chance. I've grown an immense amount of Robert Pattinson as an actor between this movie and the Batman. His range is something that needs to be studied. I knew Willem Dafoe would be excellent, but he was definitely the standout. Really, all of the voice actors are. It's one of the best English dubs I've ever heard. But I'm sure it's just as magical of an experience both ways. And while I can acknowledge the plot was difficult for me to follow at times, every scene contributes to its themes about death and what, if anything, lies beyond it. And that's what's always made me admire Miyazaki as a filmmaker, the way he's so varied in his world building and using it to present universal ideas as we watch the protagonist explore them. Protagonists that are very spread out in terms of personalities and life experiences. Look, I don't want this to be his last movie. His mind is a gift to mankind, and the thought of it being lost is devastating to think about. But if that's what comes to pass, I can say with confidence that it's an amazing way to go out, and I can't recommend seeing it enough, especially if you're a fan of Ghibli. But, um, I think you guys already know what my number one pick for the year is. Cue the music, y'all. It's time for number one. <laughs> It can't be expressed enough just how significant Nimona is as a work of art. Beautifully animated, brilliantly directed, hilarious, powerful. She turns into a shark with sunglasses on. Everything I believe film can accomplish as a form of storytelling is present in this movie. I talked about it earlier this year with my friend and colleague Bustercore when it came out, and if there's one thing that I wish I had placed a stronger emphasis on there, it's how miraculous this film's existence is. It managed to defy the odds after being left to die once Blue Sky got shut down. And with its release and the Peanuts movie getting greenlit for a sequel, it makes me happy that the most talented people People from under this studio are getting the recognition they deserve for their talents. But as unfortunate as the circumstances are, this is simply a movie that could not have been made while under the Disney umbrella. You can't just edit out Ballister's kiss with Ambrosius and have it take away from the movie's explicit subtext on what it means to be left behind and isolated from society based on your identity. That isn't how I would describe this movie to someone who hasn't seen it before, though the decision to depict topics like this in an animated movie is still monumental and shows how much respect the creatives have for the medium. This is a movie about overcoming that, bringing real substantial change in the world that'll make it more equitable for everyone around you, people you'd never imagine you'd connect with, and fighting back against individuals and systems that create barriers to try and make it impossible to do so. I think I think now more than ever you can tell how held back a lot of animated movies are with certain subject matter being deemed taboo for a younger audience, but this movie does not do that in any form, and even though there's no shortage of heavy, deeply emotional moments, it still manages to be an endlessly fun sci-fi adventure with one of my favorite duos in media history at the center of it. Watching them come together through their shared experiences, learning about each other, and having so many hysterical back and forth, you can hear how much energy and enthusiasm Chloe Grace Moritz and Riz Ahmed bring to their characters, adding so much to the sharp comedic and dramatic writing for both of them. I mean, this is what my favorite works of art do, finding the perfect balance between the fantastical and the realism that fuses into an unforgettable journey that thoroughly explores the ideas that make us human. There have been a few people saying they don't like Nimona coming back to life in the end, and while you could make the argument that it's a logistical inconsistency, I think her getting the chance to live and see the change she and Ballister got to make by coming together, by bending the rules, by him finally seeing her for who she is, is at her core is the best way of showing how this is a movie about hope. And given everything that's happened this year, that's something we all desperately need right now. It's something that I can't praise or recommend enough if you haven't seen it already. Much love to Nick Bruno, N.D. Stevenson, and the trans shark for changing my life forever. Thanks for watching, Minnows, and I'll see you again at the edge of the water. Oh yeah, I forgot about the dog movie.